<laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for taking part of your night here to join us for the powerlifting pre-competition webinar uh, in preparation uh, for Fall Fest, which is October 16th. Um, on the call tonight, it's myself, the sports director for powerlifting, Steve Bennett, uh, senior director of competition, uh, along with Derek Willis, who's our venue director. Uh, it'll be his first year as the venue director. And as I always say, I'm really excited to have him. The work that he's done um, outside of even just this event has been really helpful. Uh, really happy to have him. Um, and just like him, without great coaches like all you guys, we can't make everything happen. There's a lot of details that go into a season. Uh, so. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. So for the agenda, uh, we're gonna go look at the event information. Um, we're gonna jump into the protocol reminders, which Mike Sarnowski is going to cover. Um, oh, that's gonna be me actually, Rob, but that's okay. Oh, okay, all right, perfect. Steve will cover those. Uh, and those will be specific to powerlifting. Um, we'll talk about the entries, the powerlifting schedule, uh, the venue, some general rules, updates, reminders, um, specifically DQs on how to avoid those with your athletes. And then a few different pieces that we thought would be helpful to cover. Um, at the bottom here is the Q&A. So if you do have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat as we go along here. Uh, if you wanna raise your hand, that might be a feature that some of you know, I sometimes forget where that is. Uh, you can do that also. Um, but with the smaller group here, if we're done a section, uh, feel free to speak up also. Um, and we will address your questions at one point or another in this webinar, but we do have a good amount of content to cover. Uh, so moving along here, I will pass over Steve to talk about a COVID protocol. Thanks, Ryan. And again, as um, we, we do with all of our webinars, this is being recorded and it'll be up on our coaches resource page and we'll send these slides out to you. Um, so you can have them as a reference as well. And those will also be located on the coaches resource page. So um, yeah, COVID protocols, um, you know, Special Mix Maryland is always um, looking for updates from our international governing body, Special Mix International, as well as other organizations that uh, we're in communication with, um, as it's an ever evolving process and, and things that we need to make sure we're, we're up to date on and any changes, etc. So, um, you know, one of the things that um, we've done here for the Fall Sports Fest is similar to what we've done um, at previous events where there's more than one sport. And for instance, our summer games is every competition venue for the Fall Sports Fest will be operating um, pretty much independently and on their own. Um, so what the requirements are for powerlifting are not necessarily the same <coughs> competition that will be held um, at Fall Sports Fest. So just if there's you hear other things from your other coaches know that um there there are differences for each of the sports that will be occurring at, uh, during the fall sports fest um but regardless of that there are um two things that we want to make sure everyone is is aware of and hopefully all you guys on the call are is one power lifting is mandated that everyone who's participating volunteers officials Ryan, myself, any staff members, et cetera, are all 100% vaccinated. Um, so um, that's, that's one thing that's not required in other sports. But with that being said, um, two things that need to happen at powerlifting is, uh, one, we'll talk about the check-in process and that will, check, that will take place in the Not Arena. Um, we're still 100% confirming that, but at this time plan on it being in the front entrance on the lower level of the Knot Arena. Um, that's basically, uh, those of you who are familiar with it, the hallway where you go down to do your weigh-ins in the locker rooms, there's a little table we'll set up there that will be the check-in. Once the athletes are escorted there by their family members, they will need to meet you as the coach or one of your other designated coaches. Um, because after check-in, there's a 100% separation of athletes from family members and spectators. Uh, one clarification there is if there are any family members who are also coaches um, or are officially part of your delegation uh, for powerlifting, uh, they can remain. But otherwise, spectators and families, 100% separation um, from the athletes and all the other competitors um, in powerlifting. So once they check in and meet you as their coaches, 
Uh, the family members will immediately be told to go up to the second level in the upper bleachers. Um, that's where families and spectators will need to stay throughout the day. So once they check in with the athletes, you as a coach, those, those athletes are your, your responsibility and there is gonna be no assistance from anybody who's not credentialed or an official member of the delegation. So um, wanna make sure everyone's comfortable with that. With that being said, um, there, there needs to be a, a coach or designated member of your powerlifting squad to be there to meet those athletes um, and make arrangements with those athletes and the family members upon arrival. Um, I say that there was an example of, we had our state golf tournament recently where there were some coaches who arrived late and they hadn't communicated with um, some of the family members and athletes were saying, well, I need to check in. And it was, hey, I'm sorry, this is uncomfortable. You guys need to stay over there until your coach gets here. And there was some frustration there. So we wanna uh, prevent that if possible. So, um, and then uh, after the check-in, which opens at 7.30 there, um, parents or the spectators can meet the athletes after the awards have been presented for everyone and as they're leaving and going to their car. Um, so again, like I said, the families need to stay, stay separated throughout the entire day and they must remain up on the upper level. That's because um, from a COVID perspective, um, those individuals need to stay a minimum of 50 feet away from everybody else um, in that safe environment of the bubble, if you will, with everybody being vaccinated inside um, and during and at the, the competition uh, part of the, of, the, of the day for powerlifting. So just wanna make sure that's clear. We've had some other questions as well. Hey, my, my family members have helped out or whatever. It can't happen this year. That's gonna be all in the coaches and your, and your official delegation people. Okay. Um, so again, with powerlifting, like we said, um, we had to have 100% of everyone participating. So what that does is that puts powerlifting in its own little bubble operating independently in the low risk category. Typically the low risk category is 80% of the participants have been fully vaccinated. Um, but again, with powerlifting, it's a mandate that everyone has to be. So we're in good shape there. What does that mean? That means we will not have to do individual screenings as they arrive for volunteers, coaches, athletes, you know, anybody and everybody. No, no screening will be required. We know everyone's um, as good as they can be with the 100% vax. Social distancing. Um, although we're all 100% vaxxed, we still wanna keep that in place as much as possible during, during the day um, in, the, in, the, in the big arena, um, except when obviously athletes are warming up or competing, obviously with spotters and the weights and the loading and everything like that. Uh, we can't do powerlifting and still have six feet distance. So um, it's more so when they're waiting in the chairs and hanging out, kind of keep them separated if we can on that, that would be very helpful. Masking, um, it's optional. Uh, for people who are fully vaccinated and uh, all general public. So this is something you can also give to your families. It's not just our policy, but it's also uh, Mount St. Mary's policy is inside. Everyone has to be masked. Um, so the general public will need to be masked up in the families and stuff up in the bleachers um, at all times in the venue. Um, and again, I, I talked about the, the family and separation of the, of the participants um, throughout the whole day and the 50 feet away, et cetera, et cetera. So are there any questions on that? Okay, and like I said, um, similarly to powerlifting, flag football is a sport where the team competition component is 100% vax to participate because of the close contact. Um, but cycling, long distance running, tennis, and the flag football individual skills portion um, is not a requirement to be vaccinated. So we're hoping we can get to that 80% that I mentioned earlier at those venues to not have um, all of the restrictions that come with that if we are not in the low risk category. Um, and Mike, before, before we move forward, I just want to see if there's anything I missed or um, if you want to uh, talk on anything else, I think I got it, but. No, I think you did fine with that, uh, unless anybody has questions. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, we say that because we actually have about a 42-page COVID protocol document, 
and taking all that and condensing it into one slide. Um, I want to make sure I didn't miss anything there. So um, powerlifting schedule. Again, we always say the schedule is tentative and it will be finalized as soon as everyone leaves the powerlifting venue. But this is kind of what the plan for. So like we said, the, the check-in for coaches and athletes will open at 730. So again, just coordinate with your families and your um, athletes um, to make sure you're there and um, can meet them on time and then take care of the athletes um, once they check in. Uh, the weigh-ins will begin there um, as normal, pretty much right around that eight o'clock time frame, right down that hallway in the locker rooms. Uh, we are not having an overall opening ceremony as we've had in the past. Um, so it's gonna be a very brief powerlifting specific opening ceremony, and it will not be a long one. It will be, hello, how are you? The athlete oath, maybe the national anthem, and say let's get let's get lifting and, and let's let's get the game started. So uh, we'll have a brief coaches meeting right after that uh, venue opening for powerlifting um, at the stage area, and then um, hopefully we'll go right into competition uh, as long as we can get the weigh-ins done, get that sorted, and uh, get athletes divisioned and ready to go. Um, and again, we'll, we'll see how the day goes. Um, but at the end of competition, from planning purposes, um, plan on four and we'll see how the day goes, but um, we'll just see how, it, uh, how the day progresses, but we appreciate your patience on that. Next up, like we said, the delegation registration, kind of the check-in area. Um, we'll have a packet for each of you as head coaches for your area program. Um, that packet will be right there at that check-in area. And um, we'll need to report any scratches that you may have um, when you get there, or um, if you're not sure and somebody doesn't show, obviously, uh, we can make that adjustment on the fly, but um, if you have any known scratches, um, the earlier you can get that to us, the better we can operate and, and prepare for the day. Um, and again, we, we hit on that about coaches make raises with the athletes to meet them and communicate the process to the family members so that they're aware of what's expected and the separation and where their seating will be so that there's not some frustrations that take us away to handle that while we should be doing other, other perspectives. So you're your help on that would be greatly appreciated. Some general information similar to the past, um, the food services, um, thanks to those of you, um, I think everyone got in their, their lunch orders. So we've presented those to Mount St. Mary's. Um, we've included the officials, our volunteers, as well as all of you coaches and your athletes competing. Um, it says we'll be delivered to the venues between 11 and 1230. That does not mean at 11 o'clock, you come up to Derek or Ryan and say, hey, Lunches are supposed to be here at 11. No, if they're not there by 1230, you can ask them. Um, but again, they have a lot of lunches to coordinate, separate, um, organize, and then get the delivery out. So um, Derek or Ryan will be able to tell you, hey, this is the estimated time uh, once that starts going. So um, we can eat there in the arena. Um, the one thing I'll ask um, you as coaches is to remind your athletes and yourselves, uh, make sure we, we clean that area. And, and put things in the, in the receptacle, trash receptacle bins um, with COVID, the less we have to go around and touch individual uh, bottles of water and food and bags, um, the better and, and the more safety, more safely it can be conducted. So just uh, help us help everybody with cleaning up after uh, the lunches there. But again, those will come by delegation. Um, so you as coaches or one of your designated um, volunteers from your uh, program can pick those up and distribute them out. So we appreciate that. Again, the spectators um, will be up in the bleachers. I know I've said that a couple of times, but it's, it's really important that we stress that and that the families know that. Um, and I don't think I'll hit that anymore. Codes of conduct, as always, just some reminders there. Um, respect for all um, the athletes and families look to you as coaches your leadership positions and take cues from your verbals and your nonverbals. Um, so again, um, as, as a leader, um, you remain calm and, and take the appropriate actions and, and use the steps appropriately as a leader. So um, basically that's just, we wanna have a great experience for everybody involved and the more positive attitude you can have and dictate to your athletes, the more pleasant they'll be. If, they're, if you're frustrated and they see it, they'll get frustrated. And, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and again, our quality of service, as you as coach as well know, our number one priority is to create a great environment for the athletes 
um, with health and safety at the forefront of all decisions and everything else. So appreciate you there. Uh, we talked about the opening ceremony, won't hit that again. Um, but again, just a reminder that right after the opening ceremony there, again, that's going to be like maybe five to six minutes. We'll go straight into the coaches meeting and get you guys set for the rest of the day. And at this, at this time, I'll stop talking for a little bit and hand it over to Ryan and maybe Derek, but Ryan, I'll send it over to you and you can drive. All right. Thank you, Steve. So for the bench press um, and the deadlift here, along with the combination, uh, you'll see that we have 42 athletes. Um, that's pretty good. We had about 55-ish or so in 2019, so didn't drop a ton. Uh, looking to have a great day of competition. As you can see here, the bench press will be first. Um, and then deadlift will roll right after that and be the second lift of the day. So on this diagram, we'll start left and go right here for the most part. So there will be some pipe and drape that separate um, the delegations in the very middle there that you can see um, to where the warm up area is um, along with the staging area. So there's some warm up um benches and racks that are all lined on that side of the gym um, and that is also where the staging area will take place there will be signage that shows you exactly where that is uh, but once you're in the gym you pretty much cannot miss it um, any athlete that's warming up will warm up on that side um, and then pretty much just proceed all the way forward until they are at that stage um, at the front of the gym of that Knox Brina that is where the powerlifting venue takes place um, we will be using one um forget what it's called, one stage at a time, I guess. I will not be using two. Um, in the middle here, kind of a change from what you might have had in the past. Uh, we have had spectators kind of near the back seated in those chairs in the past. That middle, uh, those two aisles will only be for delegation members. So no spectators there. Uh, as Steve talked about before, we are happy to be able to provide a spectator area, uh, which will be on that far right side once you enter. Um, it is different for the spectators, but again, we're happy to be able to provide that opportunity. Um, other states or programs have not been able to do that. So even though it is different than what they're used to, they may grumble a little bit that they have to be near the top. But again, you can also see better when you're higher up. It's kind of like going to a sports game. I'd rather be higher up to see everything going on. Um, so that's where they will be located. Conveniently in that corner also is the awards area. So that is a little different than what we have done in the past. Typically, we've gone through that bottom area, which you exit and go to the field house, and that's where we have awards. Uh, it will be in the corner of the Knox Arena this year. Um, it'll allow the spectators to kind of be a part of that. Uh, we'll make sure the volume's not too loud to impede the lifts and make those things clear. Uh, but again, we're trying to provide an opportunity uh, that's best for everyone. We thought that was a great place. So awards will be on that right side. So again, spectators will remain up in that bleacher area for the duration of the day. There's no going back and forth between the two different, uh, the field house and the Knox Arena there. Yeah, and just to clarify, um, it says the bleacher area. It, I believe in the past, the lower bleachers have been pulled out. Um, they, they may be pulled out, but they, the spectators have to be in the upper level of the bleachers. Spectators and families cannot come on the main level and enter in um, as you see where the, where the board is or the, the drawing exit to the field house, spectators have to go upstairs um, to the upper level. And again, um, Ryan's done a good job here on the diagram. We're not 100% sure how the awards are gonna work or exactly where they're gonna be located, but we wanna put it in the arena so that the families and spectators, and actually you as coaches, can, can somewhat see the awards. I think coaches have not been able to see some of the awards presentations in the past, um, but, um, again, as Ryan said, uh, with Joel and the announcing up on the main stage, we will have a speaker system there, but it'll be facing up to the bleachers and off to the side. So hopefully not to interfere with the announcements, um, get ready for the next lifts, et cetera. We'll play that one by ear. Um, and if it is too much of a distraction, um, we'll just do verbal uh, without the uh, meeting using our, our regular voice and not the PA system. So. We'll take that one as it comes, but again, uh, to provide that area for spectators um, to see the award ceremony and keeping the, the power lifters all together somewhat in that bubble, if you will, um, this is the only way we could do it. So um, we'll see how it works. Thanks, Steve. 
So again, we talked about the awards area just now. It'll be in the back of the Knot Arena. Um, so they will be uh, conducted on a rolling basis. So once that first flight finishes, uh, which will be their bench press, as that will be the first lift they will be doing, they will go straight to the award and get uh, their award um, there. Immediately following that, they need to go back and be with their delegations um, and or proceed to warming up for their deadlift, uh, which would be their second event. Uh, so once the deadlift divisions are complete, the athlete can return to the awards area for their awards uh, in the deadlift and the double combination event. At this time, I will pass it over to Dave, who had a total of 20 minutes to review the finalized slides here, um, but he has been willing to give it a shot. Um, he's going to be more of an expert than I am here, so happy to have you on, Derek. Um, if you would cover the sport specific slides. Yep, not a problem. So uh, lifting suit, so it's a, just wrestling singlet basically. Uh, shall consist of one piece, full length suit, one ply, no patches or padding. You know, you can get it if it comes with any kind of uh, branding on it, like Inzer will make them or anything like that. Uh, just nothing added on. You'll see people tape their things on or like uh, if you're running a marathon, they safety pin their logo on that kind of thing just can't have that or any additional padding um undershirt mandatory for all lifts typically for powerlifting it's not mandatory for the deadlift because it's not making your upper body is not making contact with anything that anybody else is going to touch but uh code protocols and everything it's just a little more sanitary for everybody to have a shirt on uh socks and shoes Long socks up to the knee must be worn for the deadlift. I've been in competitions where the competition had to stop for about an hour. Somebody had to go find bleach because the bar cut somebody's shin and everything just came to a grinding halt. So knee socks are important. Make sure that everybody has them. Uh, and shoes, you know, good shoes. Like I said, tennis shoes, trainers, powerlifting shoes. Uh, Chuck Taylor kind of thing. I'm, I think they're still allowed. They were kind of a back and forth there for a while in USAPL. So I'm not really sure about that. Um, I'll have to check on it. Uh, next slide, please. All right, belts. This is the big thing that I don't think people were really paying attention in 2019 because everybody still brought the wrong belt. They still brought like the padded belt that kind of starts out narrow and goes wide in the back. It has to be the same width all the way around. Has to be a buckle, no uh, Velcro. Uh, <clears throat> it can be leather, vinyl, nylon, anything like that, non-stretch, non-metal, although that would be pretty cool to see something with a metal belt. Don't think I've ever seen that before, but that'd be pretty awesome. Uh, worn outside of the suit, yep. Uh, wraps so eight centimeters, which is roughly three and a half, four inches. Uh, maximum length of one meter. So, you're talking about the wrist wraps, we can't have knee wraps really. Uh, so not seen two meters in length, eight, eight centimeters with oh, so they may be used. Uh, so none of the super long knee wraps that you know cut off circulation, you can barely squat down with them, that kind of thing. Uh, chalk is going to be provided. There'll be a bowl up on the platform for everybody to use. And I will provide Derek scissors in case anybody's belts are too big. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yep. That, uh, that was fun. In 2019, we had to cut the padding off of some of people's belts and cut off the extra uh, width of it. So hopefully everybody, you know, got their crap together and got the right size belt this year. Yeah. The other part of the uniform, which we saw on 19, was some sweatbands. Uh, you can't have those. They just can't be more than 12 centimeters. And uh, usually, I didn't see anything on here for it. Excuse me. Um, it, long underwear, as long as they don't stick out past the legs of your singlet, it's fine. You know, if, if, you're, if your singlet is shorter than your boxers are, you know, I, just tuck them up a little bit or, you know, just try not to wear something that long, like impression uh, – shorts or anything like that underneath. All right, everything is metric. So this is a typical standard uh, metric. We're actually a, a metric country if you wanna get technical about it. Uh, so we're gonna have a 20 kilogram bar, which is about 45 pounds. The light bar will be 15 kilos, which is about 35 pounds roughly. <clears throat> 
Uh, lifter must assume following position on the bench and maintain position during the entire lift. The head and trunk, including the buttocks, must be in contact with the surface of the bench. That does not include your lower back. If you want to get a little bit of an arch, even like a, just a natural arch, your lower back doesn't usually touch the bench, just butt, shoulders, head have to maintain contact with the bench. Feet flat on the floor or on plates will put something under your feet if the athlete is too short to comfortably rest their feet flat on the floor. Uh, they cannot switch mid-lift. So if you're starting with your feet up on plates and you start to struggle in the middle of the lift, you can't slide your feet onto the floor. After removing the bar from the racks and receiving it from the spotter and loader, the lifter shall wait, elbows locked for the chief referee's signal. Very important, if your coach is giving you a lift off or the person a lift off, they get out of the way as soon as the athlete has it so that the head judge can signal the lift to start. The judge will not signal the lift to start until the coach is out of the way so the judge can get a good view. You don't want the athlete sitting there for a few minutes holding the bar, struggling to maintain the weight. Causes for disqualification of the bench. Um, a couple different, and these are all pretty common with the bench. The squats must lift, much less common, but bench has a lot of common faults. Failure to observe the signals. We have the start and the press. So any change in the elected position after the start signal, raising the head, shoulders, butt, moving the feet, that kind of thing, from the original points of the move of the <clears throat> of the contact on the bench of the floor, is a disqualification. No point of the athlete's feet come in contact with the bench or its supports. You'll see people uh, post up on their toes or even flat on the bench and just slide their feet in against the middle post of that bench. You can't do that. Uh, heaving and bouncing the bar off the chest after it's been motionless, basically like a re-dip. Once the uh, ref says press, you can't then drop down and heave it back up. Uh, pronounced exaggeration or uneven extension, there's going to be a little natural uh, unevenness between your arms, but if it gets a little bit out of hand, like the one arm locks out, the other arm still at like 15, 20 degrees, that's going to be a no lift. So that's going to be kind of up to the discretion of the judge, but nine times out of 10, it's going to be pretty obvious that it was a no lift. Uh, downward movement of the bar in the course of being pressed out. The bar is allowed to stall and remain motionless for a period of time. But if at any time the bar starts to descend back to the chest after it's already started to ascend, that's a no lift and the spotters will immediately be told to take the bar. That's a safety issue. Even if the athlete may be able to rebound from that and press it out, we cannot risk it. Yeah, one thing, Derek, I'll step in. Um, this is Steve again. Um, one thing you'll, you'll see on one of the, the last slides here is if there's any special concerns or special needs that uh, the judges and, and referees need to know. Uh, we need to know that um, as soon as possible. And I say that because I know there are some individuals and athletes who um, from a physical disability or physical um, challenge that they have, that one arm may not be able to be extended. Yeah. So we have to know that ahead of time so that we don't disqualify an athlete for a reason that just because the coach didn't say, hey, you know, Derek um, has a, a physical challenge with his right arm, he cannot fully extend that arm. So the left arm's good, but watch him on the right arm. So again, that's the notes that we need from you as coach <clears throat> that um, the referees and officials are aware and can, can judge accordingly. Steve, short anecdote. I'm sure you remember this, but back in like the 80s and 90s, there was a whole slew of people that would come into competitions and make sure to never lock their arms out when they were walking around so the judges knew that, hey, I can't lock my arms out. It's fine. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> that was a whole big thing for a while. Uh-huh. All right. Uh, other ca uh, causes for disqualification. Failure to press the bar to full extension. You jumped the gun, Steve. We were just getting to that one. <laughs> God. Um, so, yeah, generally speaking, arms locked out. Uh, <clears throat> as Steve said, if you have an issue where the athlete cannot fully lock out their elbows, tell the judge ahead of time. should be fine. Contact with the bar by lifters or spotter. If they prematurely take the bar from you or assist in any way, if they think things are going downhill and they're not told to take it and they do take it, unfortunately, that's a no lift, even if it's at no fault of the lifter. 
uh, deliberate contact between the bar and the, uh, the bar rests upright. So if the bar comes back and they slide the bar up the rack, first of all, coaches, make sure your athlete is not far enough back on the bench that that happens. Uh, ideally, we want their eyes to be directly under the bar when they lift the bar out of the rack. That way it ensures that they are far enough down on the bench that they do not make contact with the rack. And failure to comply with any of the re uh, requirements contained in the general description of lifts. So just, is it a bench press, basically? All right, the deadlift. <clears throat> bar must be positioned horizontally in front of the lifter's feet. Grip with an optional grip, both hands. <clears throat> Uh, and lift it without downward movement until the lifter is standing erect. There's something called a hitch. Uh, basically, it means once the bar starts going up, the lifter is not allowed to rest the bar on their thighs and rebend the knees to get better leverage under the bar. So it has to go up, no downward movement. Grip option when gripping the bar, either the backs of, <clears throat> of both hands face the front or over the back of one hand. So either a double over or an over under grip also known as a deadlift grip. So either one of those are acceptable. There's not really an unacceptable grip in the deadlift, as long as your hands are fully around it. Um, I know uh, we have an athlete at Carroll County who has this issue. Make sure that thumb is around the bar. That's more so they don't drop it than anything. But you know, if, if they do the thumbless grip, I don't really know if it'd be considered an overrep, just try and make sure for safety, if anything else, we get the thumb around the bar. Lifter shall face the front of the platform, so just make sure you're facing the head judge. Upon completion, knees shall be locked in a straight position, and the shoulders shall be held in an erect, not forward or rounded position. The shoulders do not have to be thrust back past an erect position. However, they're thrust back in this manner, and all other criteria are acceptable. The lifter shall be accepted. So basically, is your uh, shoulders behind your chest. If your hips locked out and your shoulders are behind your chest, you're good. That's really the only thing you need to concentrate on as a coach. Ref signal should be down. So the ref will be in front of you with his hand up and he'll say, down. At that point, the lifter may lower the bar. Signal will not be given until the bar is held motionless and the lifter is in the completed position as determined by the chief ref. Any attempts to raise the bar or deliberate attempts to lift the bar uh, shall count as an attempt. So basically, <clears throat> you can't, like some people go like, kind of move the bar around, take a little slack out of it, try to pump themselves up. You can't start to actually try to lift the bar, put it down, readjust. As soon as you make an attempt to lift that bar, that's your attempt. You only get one per flight. All right. <clears throat> Deadlift is qualifications. Downward movement of the bar or either end of the bar during the lift. Like I said, a hitch counts as one. Or like the bench press is less common than the deadlift, but if you kind of lock out the one side, maybe your grip is failing on the other side and it starts to roll down your fingers and one side of the bar starts to go down, no lift, we're going to call it. That's a safety thing. And again, we don't want to damage the platform. So no dropping. Failure to stand erect with the shoulders in the erect position. So like I said, if your shoulders aren't behind your chest, you're kind of had that rounded over, uh, I've been in a computer all day position. You know, it's not a good lift. You have to get those shoulders back. Failure to lock the knees straight at a competition lift or completion lift. <clears throat> You'll see this a lot when people try to overemphasize the erect position and they'll lean back a little bit. And once they lean back, the knees start to rebend. Uh, supporting the bar on the thighs during the performance of the lift has to maintain pressure on the way up. If you stop, you have to be grinding it. You can't just sit it down in your thighs. That's a hitch. Supporting the bar on the thighs may also include a secondary bending of the knees. I've already discussed, discussed the hitch. Lowering the bar before receiving the ref's signal. If you're anticipating the ref is going to say down and you put it down before he actually does, no lift. Make sure that the athlete waits for the command. Same thing with the bench press. Allowing the bar to return the platform without maintaining control with both hands. This doesn't just mean dropping the bar. I've seen competitions where the lifter has been disqualified. Their hands were on the bar the whole time, but they basically just went limp and the bar fell to the ground. So make sure there is at least some semblance of control over the bar as they lower it. Again, we don't want to buy a new platform. Uh, failure required any, or, uh, to comply with any of the requirements contained in the general description of the lift. Again, is it a deadlift? 
All right. Uh, before we go on from the deadlift, um, the lifter may do sumo or conventional. Uh, we don't talk about that a lot. Uh, so sumo being your feet are outside of your hands, conventional being your hands are outside of your feet. That's really all you need to know about it. You know, both are acceptable. If you have an athlete that prefers one way or the other, don't correct them. If they're better at one, go for it. All right. Next slide, please. All right, the combination. An athlete is required to compete in the bench press and deadlift combination to, go, uh, to qualify for a final score in the double combination event. An athlete's final score is calculated by adding together the two lifts <clears throat> that they have successfully lifted. The three's unsuccessful attempts in any lift will automatically eliminate the lifter from the double combination event. Basically, you get three flights in the bench and three flights in the deadlift, and you have to make at least one in each of those to qualify. So if you miss all three of your bench, you don't get the bench only, and you don't get the combo. Same thing with the deadlift. You have to get at least one. All right. Oh, that's good. Were you saying something, Ryan? No, oh, I just said thank you. Is there any oh. other questions before we move past this material? All right, we will move on. Thanks, sir. Yep. So for the results, they will be posted in the Not Arena. Uh, they e will be emailed out the week following the event also, and similar to these webinars, uh, they will also be posted on the Powerlifting Coaches resource page. Um, for anybody that has not visited that yet, when this email goes out, I always include a link to that also. Um, that's where you can find all the results, uh, the full event guide, the fact sheet, pretty much everything related to the sport, uh, along with qualifiers throughout the season, uh, will be found on that page. Uh, the protests, um, if there are any, they need to be filed by the head coach within 30 minutes of the posting of the results. So not an assistant coach, uh, not an athlete bringing that to the attention of Derek or I, that needs to come from a head coach. Um, I'd encourage you, um, I guess we have the forms for you. So if you have anything, please come see me. Um, I will give you a form, you'll fill that out. We will discuss it. Um, appeals will be addressed within 24 hours, we do not need to be submitted at the event. Um, ideally, they would be submitted at the event, though. So to clarify what that is, so if the Sport Rules Committee denies your protest, uh, you have 24 hours to appeal that decision. Uh, the Game Rules Committee will then look at that situation, and in the situation where that protest is then overturned, uh, the correct awarding will be given to that athlete, typically in the mail. Uh, the next time we see them, whatever, uh, we will get that right. And, and just to clarify, I know this was new for Ryan. Um, but yeah, the, the appeal still needs to be filed at the event. Um, and then what sometimes happens is we have a games rules committee. Where we have to convene and all of those members of the games rules committee uh, may not be available immediately and most likely will not be available immediately to rule on the appeal. So um, you submit the, the appeal if the protest is denied, if you so choose. Um, right there as soon as you get informed that the protest was denied and then uh, the games rules committee has the 24 hour to convene rule on it discuss it and uh, to be honest sometimes it does take 48 hours but the important thing is is that the games rules committee um, will take your appeal into consideration uh, make a ruling notify you and like ryan said if there if if, if your appeal has been upheld um, and it does change the results for not only your athlete, but other athletes. Um, Ryan will be informed of that and will adjust the official results that are posted um, on our website and et cetera. And then um, also um, send out the appropriate awards um, if one of those situation arises. So we also will need to know find any other athletes or coaches if the appeal is upheld. Um, and as it could affect more than just your athlete, obviously it could affect several other athletes. So I want to say on that same kind of a, a topic during the competition, like instead of like the, the protest for the awards or who won during the competition, if your lifter gets a no lift, like two, let's say two out of three uh, red lights, uh, don't just chalk it up to you think you know why. Go up to the ref and say, what did he do wrong? I guarantee they're going to at least give you an idea of what happened and why they no lifted. 
that's a good way to kind of prevent the protests. Like instead of waiting until the competition's over, it's like, oh, they should have won. Like, well, did you did you ask the ref why they didn't get the lift? It's like, no. Well, that's a good way to help prevent these situations. Don't be afraid to go up to the ref after uh, after your lifter is done and say, why did they get a no lift on this one? Yeah, that's a great point, Derek. And yeah, then- a great point, Derek. And not only for that, but also yeah. it's your first or second attempt to say, hey, I thought it was a good lift. I need to tell my athlete to do on their final attempt to make that a good lift. Yeah, give them time to correct. Yep. And again, there's nothing wrong with filing a protest, but please go through that process like Derek was just talking about. Um, It's good because you're standing up for your athlete, but make sure you're doing your due diligence as a coach also to be able to help your athlete not make that mistake again down the road. Again, like we were talking about before with those special needs, please let me know in advance so I can notify the officials also uh, so we don't have a DQ that shouldn't have been a DQ, uh, which could go back to the protests yet again, uh, again, if we don't have that in place. And if we aren't notified of that and the athlete cannot extend their arm, for an example, uh, that athlete will be disqualified. Um, Again, please have all those requests as I will also include that uh, on the email with this going out. Uh, Any special needs to be notified uh, or sent to me in advance. So we have that on record here. Medical services, we will have them uh, in the Knox arena. Um, we will also have them at the different locations throughout Fall Fest. So here you can see the different sports directors. Uh, there may be one name that you're not familiar with here, uh, which will be Ben President. He just started a few weeks ago. That is not his email. Uh, that would be Zach Sintron's email, a uh, previous sports director who's now uh, also still within Special Olympics Maryland, but working within the schools currently. Um, so we're happy to have Ben, our newest sports director, and he will be overseeing uh, the cycling venue. So if you have any questions about flag football or tennis, that goes to anger. Cycling, that will now be Ben president. Uh, and, and, and with that, Ryan, a little humor here. Who is the first one who could guess what Ben President's email should be? <laughs> See if you you may get a prize. You got to unmute yourself if you can figure it out. Any guesses? Come on, Jordan. Give me a guess. You have to spell it correctly. Obviously, be present, right? Oh, man, you're good, Jordan. You get a prize. I'll make Ryan figure out what that prize is. I'm good. <laughs> you will get a box lunch at Fall Fest, Jordan. Thank you for that. All right, so that does bring us to the end of the webinar. Uh, but like we promised at the beginning, I wanted to have this open for any questions uh, so we can answer them also um, before getting off here for the night. Is there anything that comes to mind as of now? Uh, Joel, I think you unmuted yourself. Is there anything that you had to ask? No, I just wanted to see if I could do it. Oh, you did it. Very Yay. good. <laughs> uh, Joel, I think the only thing I have it. to say, it's very important for the coaches on your point of asking the judges, on Derek's point of asking the judges what happened with the lift, it also gives the coaches a second chance to remind the judges if they had an exception for their athlete. Like they can't lock out on the left. They can't lock out on the right. Hey, judges, they did exactly what we described them to do. They get a chance to fix it right there. That that I would explain as well. That's a great point, Joel, thank you. And in case anybody doesn't know, Joel has been kind enough to come back and be our announcer again for this year. So happy to have him back. Sorry to disappoint everybody. Yep. Any other questions? Nope, not here. Good. I, I do have a quick question, Ryan. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I know that there's a lot of volunteers, uh, you know, and um, I remember two, uh, two years ago, we had a little bit of a challenge, but with, we used the other room for the awards um, because the awards are starting and, uh, and so it's the, the, the lower weight classes, the awards will start going, but all of our upper weight classes are of course still going on. So it's very hard managing as a coach what's going on. Um, and without the parents being able to assist us because they're all gonna be in upper levels, are there gonna be volunteers that can assist getting athletes to the awards and kind of monitoring what's going on with that? 
Yes, yeah, so Jordan, we do have about 20 volunteers or something uh, requested to be there. Some of those will be escorts, uh, which can help get those athletes from uh, place A to place B and back to place A. Um, okay. Yes, we will have uh, escorts there for that. Do you? I don't have GMS up. Do you have any other assistant coaches or are you the one-man show for Carol? I, I, we just got one into the system, so I hope to have two there with me. So, so it, last year, I mean, two years ago, it was just Derek and I, so it's just challenging with, with just the two of us, but I might have a third one, but both of them are kind of new, but, um, but so this, it, it could be, a, I'm, I'm confident we can get it done, but if there's a volunteer that can just assist, you know, getting them to the awards, because chances are, I'm going to miss all the awards until the end, just like last time. Okay. I hope you can bounce over there for a little bit, but uh, we will have the coaches meeting uh, before the event starts, like we talked about. Um, and that process will also be explained there. So if your assistant coach is there, they'll be familiar with that. And hopefully they can help you out uh, with that. And I haven't seen any questions in the chat, but um, you know, I think one of the things as Ryan mentioned earlier is um, due, due to all of your hard work and the hard work of the, the, the county programs and the leadership there, you as coaches, um, our leadership here at Special Olympics Maryland with Jim Schmutz as our president and other uh, senior staff. Um, we're one of the very few states who are able to do this based on all the hard work and following of the protocols that are in place at the local level all the way up to our offices here at headquarters. Um, as many other states, Ryan said, there are some states who are only having competitions at the local level, no state championships. There are some who are um, not allowing spectators at all to any of the competitions. Um, so this, you know, is, is a true testament to your hard work, the county's hard work, the hard work that we collectively have done to get to this point. So as always, um, as we talked about the code of conduct, um, this is new for all of us, but we're excited to give this opportunity to you and most importantly, the athletes to have this experience, to have this competitive opportunity. And um, there may be things that don't go 100% as planned, but um, we can all work together to help resolve the situation. But again, um, we just thank you for all of your efforts to get us to this point. And we can work together throughout the venue and the day to make it a great day for everyone. So um, just wanna say that on behalf that, um, again, we're in a great position as a state organization um, to be able to allow these competitions where other states are unable to do that at this time. I couldn't have said it any better. Thank you, Steve. And with that, you have an additional 11 minutes of your night. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us. Again, you will see this tomorrow, uh, sent out over email along with being posted on the coach's resource page. If you have questions before the event, please ask them. Uh, the morning of can get hectic. I will be around for questions then, uh, but please give me a call or shoot me an email uh, beforehand if anything comes to mind. So again, thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great night. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Have a good one.